Um, Horace fell in love with, uh, with one of uh, Felix's daughters, um, but he met Felix Adler first because he was one of his students at Columbia. So Felix Adler taught philosophy at Columbia. Horace Fries then started the religion department at Columbia. Um, and we had to remind, my colleague Bo Meyerson and I had to remind Columbia of that when we were looking to be the, the humanist religious life advisor on the Columbia campus. We said, you know, we have a very long history here and we're sure that you're going to want to include us as one of the religious life advisors. And so we'd been there for a number of years. But one of the things that, that I, I particularly appreciate about, about about, uh, uh, Horace, and he wrote a biography of his father. Uh, when he wrote about the vision of his father-in-law for Founders Day, he wrote, the ethical culture movement looks to its founder not in any desire to bow to authority, not to make of him a special example, but as one whose work and vision in bringing the movement to life remains an authentic and vital source of its spirit. From the very earliest years of the New York Society, Felix Adler believed that only group leadership could well serve the many aspects of ethical culture, and that the life it stood for could be adequately represented by no one person. So, in those early years, Adler was an idealist. Indeed, as a philosopher, he was an idealist with a capital I. Um, and that meant that he followed some of the, of, of the, um, the writings of the transcendentalist in New England, who in turn were inspired by Immanuel Kant, as, as Felix was. And that was because this philosopher of ethics said that we are each individuals unto ourselves and not the means to someone else's ends. And that's really the basis on which Adler founded ethical culture was first and foremost as individuals we have worth and dignity and that we must recognize that in one another and that it is our duty as individuals to grow morally, to progress morally. That was the first part of it. The second part of it is that we need to be in community with one another because that's how we truly learn to be ethical, is in community. It is often said about community that um, community rises and falls on who makes the coffee and who takes out the garbage. Now we are blessed that we have a wonderful maintenance staff here and they make the coffee for us, and they take out the trash. And by the way, last Sunday when I referred to David, I meant our maintenance uh, uh, fellow of staff, uh, David McCants, um, who is not well, not Dave Massey. I know there was some confusion, so I want to correct that. Um, but your card did go out to David McCants, um, because he's often here on Sundays uh, taking care of us, as all of our staff do. So we have other challenges. We're not making the coffee, we're not taking out the trash, but we have many, many other responsibilities and challenges as a community. So this morning, when I finish this homily, we will be going to the different tables, and the people who represent our committees and our other programs that we have here will be letting you know what they do. Now, I'm sure a lot of you knew, do know, because you all read the newsletter cover to cover, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you all go on our homepage every morning, right? And you check the calendar, right? Okay. You know what? We're only human. We're only human. And I know that not all of you do. Um, but we owe a great deal to our communications committee um, to make sure that that information is there, that it's in our newsletter, um, it's also on our website, and also on social media. Um, and so I really uh, appreciate those of you who go on and, and look at that. So that's one of our challenges, is making sure that we reach out not only within our community, but but outside our community to let everyone know what we're doing. What are we doing? Well, we've always had a commitment 
to social justice. And in those early days, we can see on the back of our, uh, back of our, our program on Sunday some of the things uh, that we founded, some of the things to which we contributed. But things change over the years, and that first generation that had deep pockets and were able to fund a lot of these things um, and leave us this wonderful legacy of a meeting house um, aren't really here anymore. We're more solidly middle class these days. And so we've changed our strategy as we've left those early years. We're not so much founding institutions as we are partnering with other individuals, groups, institutions who share our values. And that's a wonderful strategy for us because as we look around our community, we see that our demographic is not as diverse as we would like it to be. It is said that in the United States on Sunday morning, we are probably at our most segregated because people go to their churches, synagogues, mosques. We become very tribal on Sunday mornings. Now, we have the aspiration in ethical culture not to be tribal. As I said before, young Felix Adler was looking to create a community where everyone who put ethics at the center of their lives would feel comfortable and would connect with one another and would form community within and networks without. He said that his religion was ethics. What he did was create a culture for ethics that became our community. And I know sometimes people have difficulty with that distinction. So we have a, a, one of our, our younger members. You know, we, have, we do have different age cohorts here. I think the youngest cohort we have are millennials. We don't yet have the Gen Z. Um, by the way, I learned in terms of social uh, media that with Gen Z, they have an eight second attention filter. <laughs> Not just spit, filter. So if you don't get it out there right away, they're gone, they're gone. So we do have a millennial, a few. And, and I'm going to quote uh, from something that this millennial refers to as one of her mic drops. Religious humanism is synonymous with congregational humanism. And if you want a history of that, there are several websites, including humanisteducation.org. And along with the American Ethical Union, it includes the Unitarian Universalist Humanists, the Society for Humanistic Judaism. Many people in traditional religions who put people above dogma also consider themselves humanist. For example, the American Humans Association has, when they go tabling, uh, a stack of brochures, and it says, are you Christian? You may also be humanist. Are you Muslim? You may also be humanist. Are you Jewish? You may also be humanist. However, individuals in these groups call themselves sometimes secular humanists if they don't associate with religion. Religion is at the core of a, at its core, is a system of beliefs and values that direct one's life ideas that one lives by. And we can define it in many different ways, and, and this particular millennial really likes Algernon Black's definition, look it up, um, and also Anthony Pinn. He was my co-mentor at the Humanist Institute, which is now the education department of the AHA. And people can have negative, positive, or indifferent views of religion due to their experiences, but being included in both secular and religious circles is a big bonus, albeit often a struggle, for ethical culture. It is more than just taxes. It is helping bridge the divide between old traditions and new social systems, to which I can only add amen. And the person who wrote that and has been sharing that um, in her function as communications with both the American Ethical Union and the American Humans Association is Emily Newman, um, who is a member of three societies now, New York, Brooklyn, and Washington. Thank you for being with us today. <laughs> so anyway, um, now that we've got that out of the way, let's look at what we at our core have here in ethical culture, and that is, growing again, as Adler said, our own individual personal moral development 
and how we can affect the community and partner with others who share our values. So we have the Environmental Stewardship Group, and of course they've been partnering with our partners here, Food and Water Watch, 350 NYC. Ethical Action has been partnering with the League of Women Voters. I've been partnering with the American Indian Community House and Social Service Board. Oh my goodness, you have many partners, don't you, Henrika? And you'll be talking about those as well, including um, Radical Aging. Um, and also the, the Queen's Soccer Group. We're so proud to be supporting them. So you're going to be learning a lot about that. Engage with folks. Um, make sure that you let them know that you are interested. And if not serving on the committee, at least supporting the work that they do. And so in closing, I give the last paragraph to Felix Adler. At the end of his founding address, he said, we are aiding in laying the foundations of a mighty edifice. Now he didn't mean this building because that was dedicated in 1910. He meant ethical culture in 1876, whose completion shall not be seen in our day, no, nor in centuries upon centuries after us. But happy are we indeed, if we can contribute even the least towards so high a consummation. The time calls for action. Up then, and let us do our part faithfully and well, and oh, friends, our children's children will hold our memories dearer for the work which we begin this hour. And so, let's begin the work this hour, and I invite our chairs and program directors to head to your tables um, and to get, I know you're organized already, but be prepared um, to answer, to give your spiel, because we are gonna be passing the wireless mic around to you so that you can tell us something about uh, your programs. Um, and then when everyone has finished, we will have all of you go around and visit the tables and speak with everybody. So, thank you.